disclaimer time. To the uninitiated, there are essentially two phylums of metal music. The more melodic, catchier, more hard rock oriented heavy metal heard on the radio and in car commercials since time immemorial, as embodied by bands like Judas Priest or Black Sabbath, and the screamy scream upside down cross pentagram face paint naked chick blood spikes and face paint metal. Dark Throne is the screamy scream form of metal. If you're either closed-minded or simply locked well enough into your own personal musical biases to know it ain't your cup of moonshine, I recommend you familiarize yourself with the back button on your internet browser and leave the pissing and moaning where it belongs, in poorly animated hentai. After this point, I don't want to see any wailing and gnashing of teeth about the vocals or the harsh production quality, as that's sort of kind of the entire point of the black metal genre as a whole, so either generate a dick and deal with it, or clam the fuck up, because it's time to do the Dark Throne. Dark Throne are a black metal band. However, Soul Sign Journey is a death metal album. I understand there will be more than a few head-scratching, uninitiated wondering at the difference, so allow me to illuminate. While there are exceptions to every rule, as a matter of public record, the most easily identifiable distinguishing quality in both are the vocals. So listen the fuck up. If the singer is the Cookie Monster... <laughs> Shit's death metal. If the singer is one of the nine ring wraiths, that shit is black metal. This has been Extreme Metal 101 with Professor Razorfist. Please don't draw dicks on the syllabus. Okay, straight up. I fucking detest death metal. It's the scourge of the metal underground to me, and the noxious legion of rotund, baggy cargo shorts bedecked homunculi inhabiting its audience can suck a dick, because I'm tired of you man titty land whales throwing off the metal t-shirt size curve. It's not so bad anymore, but even occasionally now, locating a medium-sized metal shirt at a show may as well be the quest for Miley Cyrus's shame. That said, if I were gonna recommend a death metal album to someone who happens to already be a fan, Dark Throne's debut album would be one of only a handful that I would actually bother to mention. You might be wondering why in Mary Fuck, one of the central black metal bands of the 90s was bothering with generic bullshit like late 80s death metal, but you really need to consider geography here. Norway is right the fuck next to Sweden, and one of the strongest pillars of Swedish metal in the late 1980s came in the form of hugely influential death metal bands like Entombed, Carnage, Unleashed, and Dismember. So far reaching was the influence, it ultimately spread back to Florida, so it goes without saying that it also enjoyed a marked impact in neighboring Norway. Dark Throne in the late 80s, before they learned that there was more to metal than showing the fuck off, were one such band, spawning a handful of excellent demos and a technically impressive if somewhat uninspired full length by the name of Soulside Journey. To me, Soulside Journey is the sound of three quarters of a band tiring of death metal and one member, soon to be fired bassist Dag Nielsen, desperately trying to hold it together. The more dark side of metal uh, became more and more important in our lives, really. So. Uh, it was natural to to just jump off the whole uh, Bermuda shorts, uh, filthy uh, death metal bag, and uh, start playing what really meant something to us. It's solid shit, no mistake, but the punchiness and passion evident on earlier demos is largely gone. By this point, Fenris, Zephyrus, and Nocturno Culto were already moving the fuck on, so what you're left with is a technically precise, but ultimately somewhat soulless husk that suffers from a fairly egregious blending effect. Soul Side Journey, a weak, somewhat uninspired Dark Throne album, but one of the better offerings to recommend a fan of death metal. See also, not me. Next. We wanted to continue the primitive sound that bands like Bathory and Celtic Frost because thrash metal had toned down, became more straight. Death metal, on the other hand, became more technical. I saw what Chuck did with death and I was going, fucking hell, it sucks. Sorry to say. So we wanted to escape the modern metal style, the clicky drums and all that. We were drawn to just playing. At either. Having now 
encountered fellow countrymen black metal pioneers Mayhem, and like many in their area, become inspired to indulge in the darker side of metal, the three quarters of Dark Throne that weren't into sounding like every Swedish death metal band ever, decided to kick out the one quarter that was, and in the process, crank out one of the defining releases of the now burgeoning Norwegian black metal movement, a blaze in the northern sky, a furious cacophony of sinister sound that functions as a portrait of its time, a transitional period in which Scandinavia was casting off as hair metal and death metal past, and in the process undergoing a satanic renaissance. With work on a death metal follow-up to Soulside Journey entitled and eventually released as Goat Lord now shelved, Dark Throne were sadly left with a matter of a few months to crank out the first in what would become known as an unholy trinity of classic albums, which would shape the future of Norwegian black metal and by association extreme metal as a whole. As such, the death metal trappings of yore hadn't yet been completely shed, and one can easily identify more than a few headbang and riffs that crept their way in the nefarious proceedings. However, I would suggest that death metal flavor is part of what gives A Blaze of the Northern Sky its own unique charm. Whereas Soulside Journey was by the numbers death metal with a black metal twist, A Blaze of the Northern Sky is the exact opposite, and each album is a richer experience as a result. Best track will opening with a, the dense atmospherics of a satanic chant before just tearing the fuck into a breakneck blast beat assault, Cathorian Life Code, as a statement of intent, is perfectly representative of this unadulterated motherfucking classic as a whole, with honorable mention going to the pompous headbanging of In the Shadow of the Horns. Worst track? Not a one, folks. A blaze in the northern sky is mandatory black metal for a reason. The colder necro production sound of their later output isn't quite there yet, but despite the occasional foray to slight death metal riff work, the quintessential Dark Throne sound is beginning to congeal. But it didn't flower into full bloom until what came next. <laughs> What Sad Wings of Destiny is to Judas Priest, Under a Funeral Moon is to Dark Throne. The first out and out, top to bottom, open mouth, insert Lucifer's cock, unadulterated black fucking metal album from this band, and wondering which the sound of early Dark Throne and by association all of black metal came whirling furiously into form. More than that, it's my personal favorite record by the band, full fucking stop. Raw, grim, colder than a witch's tit, and guitars that buzz like a chorus of cranky, corpse-painted bees piercingly high on the treble, but with an intelligible bottom end punctuated by a floor drum that shares more in common with a long tom than a tom-tom, under a funeral moon pitch perfectly exemplifies the infernal blizzard of second wave Norwegian black metal, but with a percussive sonic mule kick to the scrotum and that snare drum sorely lacking in its contemporaries. It's also the final album on which guitarist Sapphiris would perform, and while much of what would come later is indeed spectacular, I've long believed the band would benefit greatly in the present from a third collaborator to keep Fenris and Nocturnal Culta from furiously fucking agreeing with each other all the damn time, an album unmistakably weaned on vintage Bathory hell Hammer and Sodom that thunders the fuck off on its own musical path with a conviction and attitude that rivals those of its antecedents. While the album is one protracted highlight, my personal favorite is a downpaced kick of the cock entitled To Walk the Infernal Fields, featuring some of the punchiest drumming and harsh guttural shrieks I've ever encountered in the genre of black metal. Indeed, as a vocalist, Under a Funeral Moon represents Nocturnal Culto's absolute apex, with some of the throatiest, shrill, yet simultaneously dynamic and not at all homogenous shrieking the man has ever laid the fuck down. My heart and my soul. Yeah, yeah, all he's doing is screaming, I hear you say, but I can tell you, as someone who's done it, there is a craft to it. You can't just scream in one register constantly, and bands that do tend to blend the fuck together. Hell, that's easily the thing I detest so much about death metal to begin with. Executing the proper black metal vocal is a delicate dance, knowing when to pull back, when to crank the throttle, when to drop register, and when to soar like a fucking ring wraith. And Nocturno Culto is one of the uncontested best in his field. Under a funeral moon, the crown 
to top Dark Throne's unholy trinity of early 90s albums. Next. <laughs> The problem one invariably runs into while recommending Transylvanian Hunger, and I personally believe the true impetus for the negative backlash the album has seen increasingly in recent history, is the hype surrounding this legendary album so eclipses the product itself, there's simply no way the final result could conceivably live up to it, particularly when most albums that attain this level of recognition as a seminal work, whether it's Number of the Beast, Master of Puppets, or Ace of Spades, are generally more catchy, immediate, and impactful upon the first listen. Transylvanian Hunger isn't an album that's attempting to wow you with just one guitar part or one vocal line, and they're certainly not trying to impress you with the hey let's bang a couple of rulers on a dirty man drum sound either. It's a textbook case of an album intended to be taken as a cohesive whole. Don't listen to just one song and expect to get it. Find the coldest room in your house, turn out the lights, toss the record on the stereo, crank it to 11, and allow the frigid soundscapes of Transylvanian Hunger to envelop you. Taken on those terms, Transylvanian Hunger is a horrific, dark, sublime masterpiece with frostbitten four-track production and a thick, muffled, dreamy quality that's never quite been duplicated no matter how many times hacks have tried, not even by the band itself necessarily. In many ways, this is where the suicidal slash depressive black metal subgenre finds its genesis. Not that we should hold that against it. Whether it's Leviathan, Draugar, or even the smack addicted boy who cried suicide himself, Zasthor, all the proponents of so called depressive black metal cite invariably Transylvanian Hunger as one of their longest abiding musical inspirations, and that is no fucking accident. If I have one real critique, it's with the lyrical content. Some is adequate, but a few of the songs, namely those whose lyrics were written in Norwegian by Varg Vikernes, lone musician and founder of Burzum and patron saint of Portland permaposers the world over. Putting aside the fact that black metal was made in England and even the Swedish motherfuckers in Bathory were hip enough to that fact to write all their lyrics in English, while I can't speak the procession of unbridled fucking goofiness that is the Norwegian language, I can read it, and more than a few of these lyrics aren't even fucking black metal, let alone in keeping with the tone of the album. In the hall with meat and mead, listen, Fark. I get that you wish you were born in a different century so you could be the shrimpiest, most pretentious hipster viking in world history, but a song about grease and poles with a bunch of Norsemen with hairy assholes and a meat hall being featured on an album called, of all things, Transylvanian Hunger makes about as much sense to me as a song entitled Jews for Jesus. And returning to my original point, write your lyrics in English, you Bathory plagiarizing boob you. Best song, well as I said, this is one seamless work, but as a personal favorite moment of mine, it would have to be the song that translates roughly into Castle in the Distance. <laughs> Worst track? None. Transylvanian Hunger, an immutable monument to black metal that demands to be taken on its own terms. I recommend that you fucking do so. Next. <laughs> Transylvanian Hunger and its follow-up, Panzerfaust, were both released at a very strange and lamentable time for Dark Throne, a fact that Dark Throne's drummer and Spoonie's long-lost Norwegian uncle Fenris recounts in detail in the embarrassingly obsequiescent Varg Vikernes love letter documentary from two New York hipster filmmakers, Until the Light Takes Us. Short version, Fenris was good friends with both the man who essentially founded the Norwegian black metal movement, Euronymous of Mayhem, and the douchey plagiarist who would ultimately murder him, Varg of Burzum. But put all the seed drama aside, folks, the friend who wrote the lyrics on two of their all-time classics murdered the friend who turned him on to black metal in the first place. And the detrimental effects weren't merely personal either. The resultant drama, virtually all of which swirls around and was compounded by the serial self-promoter Varg fucking Vikernes, took Norway within the span of two entire fucking years from being a nexus of creative expression and the centerpiece of an entire musical explosion 
to the site of several actual explosions with a history of murders and infighting that made it into the de facto Compton of black metal and ground zero for Portland-based crime fiction aficionado filmmakers with flat zero appreciation of the music or its history and an unflaggingly throbbing erection for the trite musics of Burzum. It's no wonder Dark Throne have grown increasingly isolated and dismissive of what today is described as true Norwegian black metal. The scene has been sublimated by cunts! Panzerfaust, however, is a product of that isolation, and in my opinion, all the better for it. A step up production-wise from the four-track manifesto Transylvanian Hunger, but with a slightly weaker vocal performance from the usually exceptional Nocturno Culto. Best track? Well, there are no shortages standouts, from the thudding bombast of Quintessence to the thrashy headbanger triumphant gleam, but my personal favorite standout is the Black Sabbath-infused doom metal worship of the Hordes of Nebula. the weakest, I would have to confer that dubious distinction upon Beholding the Throne of Might, a transparent attempt on Dark Throne's part to full-on fucking clone in the shadow of the horns from a blaze in the northern sky. Sloppily produced vocals aside, Panzerfaust in many ways built and matured upon the formidable foundation of the classic Transylvanian hunger, making the fact that this album is so frequently overlooked and even excluded from inclusion in their classic unholy trinity all the more quizzical. Panzerfaust fucking slays. Next. <laughs> You see, for my money, Dark Throne doesn't actually have an unholy trilogy. What they have is an unholy pentalogy, beginning with 1992's pestilent opus, A Blaze in the Northern Sky, and concluding with perhaps the single most often overlooked album in their darksome discography, 1996's black thrash-laden monstrosity by the name of Total Death, an apocalyptic rhapsody rife with vintage Dark Throne, but with an almost imperceptible touch of 80s thrash metal. That's right, in 96, at least a decade and a half before every long-haired, talentless goober in Canada hopped on the whole black thrash bandwagon. But in the immortal words of Ridley Scott, being ahead of your time is just as bad as being behind the times. And even I pretty much missed this album entirely when I was undertaking the initial process of purchasing the band's entire discography back in the late Cretaceous. But over time, perhaps more than any other single album, Total Death has taken deep-ass root in my musical subconscious, and as a result grown in my estimation to the point that this is almost tied with Under a Funeral Moon as my favorite Dark Throne record. The wintry, atmospheric mysticism of second-wave black metal commingling with the raw, thudding, headbanging catchiness of 80s thrash. What's not to fucking like, folks? Best track... <laughs> appallingly difficult decision, but my personal favorite moment is a slower moving bit of rhythmic experimentation entitled Majestic Desolate Eye. <laughs> Perhaps most curiously of all, particularly for a Norwegian black metal album of this time frame, virtually every song on Total Death clocks in at four minutes or less with absolutely nothing exceeding six minutes. The stark antithesis of what their peers, the in my opinion phenomenally overrated Emperor, were doing in the mid to late 90s. Total Death, the exclamation point at the end of a great big F-bomb laden sentence known as Dark Throne's classic period, and my very strong second favorite, Cartoon Finishly underrated. Next. After an uncharacteristic two-year pause in the band's output, during which Fenris experimented with side projects like the ambient Neptune Towers and the doom metal Isengard, and Nocturno Culto briefly joined Satyricon, with the release of Ravishing Grimness in 1999, we begin to enter what I consider Dark Throne's middle period, a time frame in which the band seemed to grow disenfranchised with the Norwegian black metal scene, which by this point was being milked like a fucking dairy cow by a slew of monetarily-minded Johnny-come-latelys such as Dumu Borgir and Gaul 
fallen king of Gorgoroth, at least one of whom Fenris has expressed repeated and, in my opinion, fully justified contempt for. These are, in Dark Throne's eyes, not black metal musicians, but full-on public figures far more interested in cashing in or stewing in their own bullshit, posing with wine glasses, saying Satan, and forming a cult of personality than making a musical statement that resides somewhere beyond the realms of gallingly generic. Pun very much intended. Satan. <laughs> oh, wait, you serious? Let me laugh even harder. <laughs> the sad irony, of course, is that by distancing themselves musically from the Norwegian black metal scene, gallingly generic is exactly what Dark Throne slowly became, and in that sense, ravishing grimness has become emblematic of the period. Far and away, Dark Throne's most doom-infused, down-paced record to date, with the breakneck blast beats of yore thrown out with the bathwater. <clears throat> along with the songwriting, and the award for most appropriately titled Song of the Century goes to Lifeless, an utterly limp, droning, repetitive opener that proves to be full-on fucking prophetic. The most disappointing aspect of Ravishing Grimness is that I love Downpaced Dark Throne. To Walk the Infernal Fields is one of my favorite tracks off Under a Funeral Moon. Hell, even with other black metal bands like, say, Bathory, my favorite tracks are more likely to be Downpaced Headbangers like born for burning, rather than Blitzkrieg black metal like, say, I don't know, Massacre. Yet the songwriting on this record is so phone the fuck in, even I can find little to nothing redeemable. That said, The Claws of Time is a clear standout in an otherwise abysmal effort. Norwegian black metal had transformed, and Dark Throne were transforming right along with it. It's just a shame the first product of that metamorphosis had to be one of the worst albums of this band's fucking career. Rick Rude is fucking ravishing. This album is a ponderous, repetitive sack of shit. Leave it to rot in the bargain bin where it belongs. After a qualitative landslide like Ravishing Grimness, fortunately there's nothing left to do but ascend, and indeed in every way that's possibly fucking matters, 2001's Plague Wielder benefits from the balls on chin, unceasing shittiness of its predecessor. With Ravishing Grimace, they'd already done the hard shit. They'd stripped off the face paint, raised the production, slowed the pace, incorporated all the punk and doom elements old school fans utterly detested. In short, they were over the hump, and now it was time to write some actual fucking songs, which is precisely what they goddamn did. Unleashing a punk rock-infused, vaguely doomy musical assault that ranks as the strongest single effort of Dark Throne's middle period. And the aforementioned unrepentant doom metal elements find shape in the album's standout, one of my all-time favorite Dark Throne tunes, Command. <laughs> The album's Achilles' heel, however, is that it opens with its worst track, Weakling Avenger. Far from irredeemable tripe, mind you, but next to heavier fare like I Void Hanger and catchier fare like Reek, Weakling Avenger lives up to its namesake. Disregard the haters, Plague Wielder is a fucking gem. And speaking of hate. <laughs> And yes, feel free to punch me in the dick for that pun. The more I refamiliarize myself with this era of the band's career, the more convinced I am that mid-period Dark Throne gets a raw deal. Black metal elitists don't like it because it's too avant-garde and not in their nebulous appraisal on par with the band's earlier material. Johnny Come Lately's on MetalSucks.net who beat it raw to Dark Throne's recent output don't enjoy it because the album covers don't make a neat-looking patch for their studded denim poser vest. But Dark Throne from 1999 to 2006 are the first band since fucking Venom to draw some obvious and well-written musical parallels between early black metal and punk rock without directly quoting from either, which is more than you can say for this glorified cover band that Dark Throne has disintegrated into in the present. And 2002's Hate Them is a prime example of this phenomenon. Seven tracks of balls-out black metal with a twist of supremely well-executed punk. The most killer track on the album for me is the hypnotic hymn by the name of Str 
striving for a piece of Lucifer, featuring one of the bleakest riffs of the band's entire catalog. <laughs> In truth, the entirety of the album is solid to excellent with no legitimately weak tracks, although a couple of songs suffer from a fair bit of needless repetition, particularly the droning but nonetheless brutal fucked up and ready to die. But even the fact that a song like this that features no shortage of memorable moments, not to mention a spine-snapping breakneck blast beat intro is one of the record's weakest tracks, is more a testament to the album's overall quality than an indictment of the song itself. Hate Them stands the perfect complement to its similarly underrated predecessor, very much recommended. <laughs> Taken at face value, 2004's Sardonic Wrath is notable as effectively the very last black metal release of Dark Throne's career. In actuality, the band had been shedding the musical conventions of the genre for the better part of the last half decade by this point, and even Sardonic Wrath itself features more than a tablespoon of the crust, punk, and even speed metal influences that became more prevalent to the band's latter-day output, alongside the pervasive doominess so often characteristic of mid-period Dark Throne. But at least for me, Sardonic Wrath is the sound of a band that no longer wants to play black metal. Box playing it and we had all these riffs flying, but we would only let very selected few of them fit into that box. But then we broke down the wall. From the lyrics, to the music, to the presentation, every atom of this record resents the genre and what it's become in the present. And who can fucking blame them, given the utter farce that was Norwegian black metal by the year 2004? Dumoulin Gear were jamming on Eurovision, Satyricon were on the fucking Billboard charts, fuck, I'm not even in the fucking scene and I want to disown it. Consequently, what we received with Sardonic Wrath? is by the numbers black metal, as typified by the fully inflamed boil on the asshole of this album. I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce it in Norwegian, but Checkmate Jesus Christ is the translation, which between the bouncy double-time swing beat and the main riff that sounds like the table scraps from a junior high pop-punk band is full-on fucking clown music. <laughs> Sacrificing to the God of Doubt picks up a fair bit of the slack with a catchy-ass riff and a midsection that spotlights some of the more interesting and rhythmic experimentation in what is essentially a doom metal song. In fact, like most of the band's middle material, I find it to be infinitely more interesting when the band is at their doomiest. Sardonic Wrath isn't the best, but with its seamless fusion of the darker atmospherics and apocalyptic pace of black metal, with more contemplative droning doom metal passages and punctuating each with more than a few four in a full-blown punk, at least it's a completely unique musical statement that still sounds distinctly Dark Throne. Which is more than you can say for what's to come. <laughs> The death of mid-period Dark Throne, and in the eyes of many, the death of the band itself. In reacquainting myself with the record, I find the cult is alive as both better and worse than I remember. Without question, the most punk-laden offering for the band to that point, but while still retaining something of the band's former style, a feat none of Dark Throne's subsequent output has managed or even attempted to accomplish. What I find personally galling, however, and this applies to more than just Dark Throne, is when a given band or artist becomes so thoroughly distracted by insane Ancillary bullshit, whether it be personal tribulations, socio-political posturing, or blithering metal scene queen horseshit that they obsess over it lyrically. Michael Jackson, for example, was never quite as good when half his songs were devoted to whinging about his fallacious child abuse allegations and his vilification in the press. Dangerous. <laughs> Michael Jackson is pretty dangerous, <laughs> and he ain't even rock and roll. <laughs> he, was, he was offending lots of people, right? 
Yeah, would you? Uh, was it you? Would you lend your children to Michael Jackson? Hey, Michael. Maybe not. No. Take my children for the weekend. <laughs> and with well over half of this record dedicated to Fenris sobbing into his pillow about how fanboys expect his band not to monge on Harry Cox, you know, Darth Throne have fallen prey to the self same preoccupation. Not because that isn't viable lyrical subject matter, but because any way you slice it, you've taken your eye off the ball. You've stopped concentrating on what makes your band great or how you can strive to make it even greater and have instead indulged a personal obsession at the expense of your own fucking music. As typified by the We Wish to Christ We Were a Mid-80s Thrash Band writing our legally required pervy song, Graveyard Slut. A ripe fucking bomb that lacks both the riffage and clever lyrical subtext to make drunken junior high metalheads chortle with adolescent glee. First song at the graveyard. If you want to hear what one of those songs sounds like when it's done right, consult Coven's 1987 masturbatory symphony by the name of Iron Dick. The Cult is Alive wouldn't be the most egregious offender in the years to come, but it is the album where Dark Throne first took their eyes off the aforementioned ball, and they haven't caught fucking sight of the bastard in the four albums since. I remember buying this album on day one, loving the idea of a marriage between punk and black metal, shoving this sumbitch into my car stereo, and just leaving it there for a solid week and a half, presumably until the inevitable moment arrived that I got it. But after two full weeks trying to brainwash myself into digging it as both a punk rock and black metal fan, I was forced to admit that this album is just fucking there. Not an abortion, because abortions actually make you feel something. The cult is alive simply lies there, stewing in its own unique brand of sedentary narcissism and dares you to give a fuck. In literally hundreds of listens since 2006, I still can't fucking oblige it. I said it then and I'll say it now. Next. <laughs> Hey, you know what I like? Albums that aren't this one. Not because it isn't black metal, not because it doesn't sound like their earlier shit. Who gives a fuck as long as the album's good, right? Wanna throw some punk in my black metal? Fucking go for it. The band that started black metal, the almighty Venom, was halfway to being a fucking punk rock band to begin with. You can detect punk underpinnings in every first wave black metal band from Bathory to Hellhammer to Sodom, and every mid-period Dark Throne record from Plague Wielder to The Cult is Alive have incorporated these elements and by and large done it successfully. It can work. And if anybody's gonna enjoy it, it'll be me. For fuck's sake, I got into black metal through punk rock, aggressive thrash punk to be exact, the genre that slobbering retards run around calling power violence for no discernible reason in 2014. If there were ever a target audience for fuck off and die, you're fucking looking at them, but I'm telling you, to your face, this album is ass. Not part shapely Raquel Darian ass, Ralphie Mae in a thong looking like two pallid burlap sacks of chicken and dumplings divided by a fucking shoestring ass. And here's the core problem, Dark Throne. You didn't start as Motorhead or Venom. You started as a generic late 80s death metal band. You can buy up all the obscure vinyl in Christendom. You can devote half of the album jacket to Uncle Fenris's run-of-the-mill metal recommendations. It's not gonna change your origins. Hell, Dark Throne had to develop the punk style as they matured, but even then, Dark Throne version of punk is, here, let me fiddle fuck around on guitar while Fenris sings in the hello voice from fucking Seinfeld. Hi. Hello. <laughs> fuck the press and their endless barrage of inapplicable comparisons because this isn't Motorhead. Motorhead knows what a song is. Hell, this isn't even Dark Throne. Not even shitty Dark Throne. It's Farce Throne. It's what happens when the shittiest Hellhammer cover band in the world suddenly starts writing originals. Fuck Off and Die isn't a title, it's a description. Fuck every note of this album. <laughs> Oh, look.
More FOAT. What a treat. I sure hope there's two more albums of this bullshit. And let's be real, Fenris. You're not doing this merely because you love classic metal. That's one component, sure, but we all know what this is really about. Christ knows no one else in the music press will call you out in your mental gymnastics, so for once, let's just come right the fuck out with it. In 2014, you know you cannot write an album that will surpass or even equal your first six records. Can't fucking do it. You're not boldly championing the cause of old school metal. You're cowering behind a table in pants-shitting fear of your own musical legacy because it's a fuck of a lot easier to assume the musical identity of someone else and do it badly than to live up to the artistic expectations associated with your seminal earlier work. You like late 70s, early 80s classic metal so much, let's talk about a classic metal band that was in a similar situation. One of my favorites, except. Next to the Scorpions, this is arguably the biggest German rock band in history. Having left a dizzying musical legacy in the form of albums like Restless and Wild, Metal Heart, Breaker, and Balls to the Wall, they reformed in 2010 after nearly 15 years of absence, and they did this not only while encumbered by the resultant public expectation associated with a band with their musical catalog, they had to do it all without their original singer Udo Dirkschneider. Did they bridle and whine and beat around the bush in confronting their musical legacy, skirting their past successes by turning into a shitty punk metal tribute band? Fuck no. They looked it dead in the eye and they cranked out Blood of the Nations, Stalingrad, and Blind Rage. Three albums in the exact same style as their earlier records that stand up against and in the eyes of many even surpass the motherfuckers. And Dark Throne could do that too, but first you'd have to crawl out from behind your wall of eBay vinyl, slap on some corpse paint, grow a dick, and write something that is actually in danger of being compared to your previous work. I don't hate the crust punk and NWOBHM style of retro metal that Dark Throne are paying homage to. I hate that a band that helped to change an entire genre has reduced itself to performing an homage. A shitty homage with zero original ideas of its own to contribute. A vacuous rehash of an early 80s metal scene this band were barely a fucking part of. Fuck this album. Next. <laughs> The title of the fourth song on Circle the Wagons is essentially autobiographical. Your music, Dark Throne, is a stylized corpse. Sound, fury, and rampant outright musical quotation as signifying exactly nothing. The irony, of course, is that the entire reason you divorced yourself from the black metal scene is because of the influx of new bands doing nothing but quoting other fucking bands. You're no better than the maelstrom of mediocrity that is modern Norwegian black metal. You're fucking worse, because even the absolute shittiest of those bands, let's say... Throne of Catarsis, for example, through their unflagging devotion to their music, are occasionally capable of tripping backwards and stumbling into something halfway fucking original. You are a retro metal novelty devoid of any discernible identity of your own, and this record is yet another exercise in image and contrarian scenester bullshit over actual songwriting. Fuck. What songwriting? Some of this shit sounds like they flipped on the tape deck during rehearsal one day and just said, fuck it. so long as your band doesn't eat a dick. There's an American black metal band by the name of Krieg whose entire discography has been improvised on the spot, but you can't pull that shit off because you're far too singularly obsessed with the idea of pissing off your two remaining original fans or pandering to the curly mustachioed stooges at Pitchfork and Blabbermouth to drag yourselves from the self-deceived brine of your own bullshit and even conceive a decent fucking song. Circle the wagons, the crowning indignity of modern farce throne. Incinerate this unbridled fucking fail. <laughs> Nocturno. If you're going to insist on playing a style of music like speed and power metal, which outright demands it, then hire a fucking singer. What you're doing is not an homage to bands like Manowar and King Diamond because Eric Adams of Manowar, wait for it, can actually fucking sing. What you are right now, whether you like to admit it or not, is retro metal. And the problem with that is that there are already a shitload of bands, particularly in neighboring Sweden, that for over a decade at least have been doing exactly what you are doing 
infinitely better than you're doing it. Wolf, Enforcer, Bullet, Eclipse, never mind all the shitty Canadian knockoffs like Striker that are just ripping off the Swedish bands. You've taken Dark Throne from a pioneer in its own genre to a superfluity in someone else's. Pitchfork.com can host all the hipster circle jerks they like in honor of this weapons-grade mediocrity. In five years' time, everyone will still be listening to the Unholy Pentalogy, and they will have forgotten this album's name altogether. After Punk Throne overstayed its fucking welcome on Circle the Wagons, scoring terrible reviews even on hipster foundries like Pitchfork, which are normally all too eager to tell the fully nude emperor his clothes rock ass, the underground resistance sees Dark Throne shed those elements almost entirely, presenting yet another radical shift, this time towards thrash, viking, and folk metal. Folk metal. Folk Me The same fucking thing that Fenris's side project Isengard already fucking is. They, either way you slice it, they slapped the Dark Throne logo on a fucking Isengard album and the retro metal poser posse finished in their pants simultaneously. What the fuck is wrong with these people? I mean, first you were a superfluity in black metal, then in punk, then in speed metal, then in power metal, and now you are literally a superfluity next to your own side project. I don't give a fuck how high the scores are. I give less than a fuck how many simpering maiden fanboys throw their sopping wet panties at this record. The Underground Resistance is just another half-assed quotation of early 80s bands that actually lived it by a washed-up band that didn't. Cynical and disingenuous like every note of music this band has written since 2007. Avoid it like Fenris avoids Pro Tools. <clears throat> Well, that deteriorated quickly. <laughs> for all the latter-day negativity espoused, I still have immense respect for Fenris and Nocturno Culto. Dark Throne remains one of my absolute favorite bands, and not merely for their older material, either. They've made immense pioneering records. They just haven't done it in the last ten years. I can respect the fuck-the-world attitude. For fuck's sake, look at my show. Just don't do it at the expense of a decent fucking song, or you'll end up with four glorified fucking rehearsal tapes in rapid succession. Don't be a half-assed maiden or a fifteenth-assed motorhead, take your cock in your hand, own your musical legacy, and be a badass Dark Throne. I'm Razor Fist, and until our next excursion into the ethereal expanse of the metal mythos, God fucking speed. Look, big sunglasses, not emperor sunglasses, big, big sunglasses. Very important. Always big sunglasses, cool band.